Who was in the f***ing car with you? I'm not doing nothing. I want to know. Who pulled the f***ing trigger, Brian? We go to the gas station. I'm promising this lady that everything is going to be all right. Does she believe me, man? Does she believe me? But I don't understand why he killed her, though. You know what I mean? She did everything he asked, bro. Right? And he shot her in the back of the head, bro. I literally see sitting in the passenger seat looking at her hair. It was like some slow motion shit, bro. Like, I don't know what the f do, man. She shot her again when she let her go. She shot her inside her fing head, bro. She fing shot her while she was. She was already. She shot her once in the back of the head, dude. Del Sisson was driving past Sayoto Grove Metro Park on February 9th, 2017, when he spotted a man standing by a car on the side of the road. Dale got out of the vehicle and asked if he needed assistance. The man, Richard Bonner, replied, Don't you see it? He pointed into the snowy grass several feet into the park. Dale saw what looked like a mannequin in the snow on the side of the road. As he got closer, it became clear that he was, in fact, looking at a nude female body lying on her back with her left arm over her face. Blood covered her head and face, the result of two gunshot wounds. So we've got cars going to 104. Okay. And all they could give us was the Scioto Grove Metro Park. So not sure like if it's at the entrance. Uh -huh. There is possibly a body. Oh. It's gonna be, he said possibly a female who is bloody with an arm over the face. Okay. When crime scene investigators arrived on the scene at Sayoto Grove Park, they discovered that the woman was wearing a gold-colored chain necklace and a pendant with blue and white-colored stones, as well as ball-shaped earrings in her ears. These would be useful to help identify the body, as would the oval-shaped tattoo on the left side of her torso. It wouldn't take long for that identification, as Columbus police were in the process of filing a missing person report filed by roommates of 21-year-old OSU student Reagan Delaney Tokes, who didn't return home from her job at the Bodega Bar on February 8th, the day before her body was discovered. Reagan had last been seen leaving work that night at 9.30 p.m. Her car, a 1999 Silver Acura, was also missing. On February 10th, officers located the missing vehicle at 708 Oakwood Avenue, where it had been abandoned. During their investigation, they discovered a condom and plastic ties near the car itself. In the trunk, they found a red gas can missing its spout, which they found in the grass a short distance away. The inside of the vehicle smelled strongly of gasoline. They found latent prints, which they collected for the lab, as well as three Chase bank receipts, a McDonald's receipt, several napkins, and a tube of Burt's Bees lip wax. Ashes were found in the car's cup holder, which belonged to one of the greatest finds, a cigarette butt. When the DNA on the cigarette was processed, it matched one Brian Goldsby, a tier three offender and former convict out of prison on parole. By this time, the police had gathered a significant amount of information through interviews, tips, and CCTV, and had a pretty good idea of what transpired after Reagan left Bodega on the fateful day that would be her last. They sent a SWAT team to Brian's home and at 4 a.m. on February 11th, they arrested him. He was then brought to the police department for interrogation. This is 30-year-old Brian Goldsby. Having experienced a troubled childhood, he began to build an extensive history of petty theft starting at the age of 13. In November 2010, the severity of his crimes escalated as he abducted a woman and her two-year-old child, forced her to withdraw money from ATMs, made her engage in non-consensual oral activities at her home, then stole her DVD player. He served six years in prison for this crime, chalking up 52 serious infractions during his incarceration. Now he finds himself in the hot seat again, this time for kidnapping, assault, and murder of 21-year-old Ohio State University student Reagan Tokes. However, through the course of his interrogation, a story that began as a simple robbery attempt became something far more sinister than anyone could have ever imagined. The following never-before-seen footage has been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed attorney and former criminal prosecutor, a licensed clinical psychologist, and a former licensed professional counselor. Ooh, it's chilly back here. Yeah. Brian, you ready? It's cold. I don't know. Give me a blanket or something. 
How long does it go, uh, take for me to get a cigarette? I'm going to get the formalities out of the way. And then I have no problem. I'll work with you. You work with me. Here's the thing. Truth. You know, All right. cooperation. Sometimes interrogators will use a quid pro quo, a Latin phrase that literally translates to this for that or something for something to get information from a suspect. A quid pro quo in this context is when the interrogator gives the suspect something that either seems to be a secret or as a favor, like a cigarette in exchange for something the interrogators want from the suspect, which is usually information. I'm Nick. I'm Nick. Right. Sorry, we've been under these circumstances. Have you consumed drugs or alcohol in the last 12 hours? Yes, sir. What? Marijuana. All right. His admission to recent marijuana use may be a factor in Brian's seemingly relaxed state. The detectives have him follow along as they read his Miranda rights, then sign to acknowledge that he understands them. I have a band aid real quick. Yeah. Um, you want a band aid for that? Please. All right. <clears throat> Did he flip you when they put that thing on you? That's it. Somebody's like skin your nose is when you saw it. When they had them, the flex cuffs on you, the, when they cut that, but they pinch you, and it, it's like a triangle. Yeah, these, these guys are going grab one. A triangle. The officers are being friendly and straightforward with Brian, which is a component of the Reed interrogation technique. Generally, officers will begin with a non-confrontational approach to build rapport, which often changes to more direct and aggressive questioning as they get to the important questions, or if the suspect is dishonest or uncooperative. Brian, you're not here by accident, right? You didn't just happen to stumble upon this and you're here. Okay. You're here because we have a pretty good amount of evidence on, on what happened. You're staying at, on Forest Street, correct? Forest Street. Forest. Yeah, oh, that, that, that's your address, correct? Yes, sir. All right. I know it's the ankle monitor, so it's, it's a group home, mm -hmm. correct? You just got out of prison. Yes. Okay. And you have an ankle monitor on, obviously. Mm -hmm. So it's tracking you. Yes, sir. Okay. The ankle monitor is an important part of evidence in this case, as it reports not only where he's been, but also a timeline of the locations that Brian has visited. The lead detective leaves momentarily to get Brian a Band-Aid for a cut on his arm then resumes the interrogation. Where were you Wednesday night? Now, remember, before you start talking, that we want to know the truth, okay? That's all we're after. We know what's going on, we just want to know the why. Okay, so where were you Wednesday? Suggesting that the detectives already know that he's committed the crime and are only interested in finding out the motive are part of the Reed Technique's positive confrontation method. This technique encourages Brian to forego denials and affords him the opportunity to explain what happened. How many cigarettes? I can't get you cigarettes. I can have a cigarette. Wait some out. I mean, words. I might have a pack. Let me go see. I'm going to have to put you in some shackles. Leg shackles and We're going to have to go outside. Well, you know what I'm saying? All the smoke. Yeah. We can't smoke in here, man. Hey, they're going to want to know. We have to get all kinds of permissions before we do this. Right. Because to smoke cigarettes? Yes. Because i got to take you out of here to do yeah. that. I can't let you smoke in here. And they're going to ask, and see being cooperative? Is he telling you what you want to know? So the way that that works, you give me a little bit, we'll verify that you're telling the truth, we'll give you a little bit, give and take relationship. The detectives reinforce the give and take relationship they're trying to establish to motivate Brian to be honest and straightforward with them, and as a way to continue to build rapport. Tell me the truth. Where, where were you Wednesday? What was going on Wednesday? I was, uh, I was at work. The officers spend the first 10 minutes trying to establish a timeline of the evening. I was over my girl's house at night. Well, what, what's your name? You want to be near me? No. No, it's up north now. Yes. No, when you say up north, you mean... It's off of Atwood Terrace. Atwood Terrace? Yeah. Okay. Even though it's easy for detectives to discover his girlfriend's name, Brian refuses to provide names for anyone possibly because of his general distrust for police, or to avoid being considered a snitch. His girlfriend's name is Hattache Hattie Jackson, and she has a role to play in the story as well. Hattie actually spoke to an officer and described her relationship with Brian. 
It was really strange to me because usually um, a man, they won't let you meet the people who's close to them unless they really like you or mm -hmm. something like that. So mm -hmm. I guess. But it, to me, it was too early to, for that. So um, I started asking him for money. Yeah. For <laughs> No, I didn't know. You were just talking no, you're about fine. it. <laughs> we, uh, I never got to that point with him. I don't know why. Usually I would just um, have and then just leave in my own business. Um, I don't like relationships. I'm not comfortable around males, all that. So I tried not to get in a committed relationship. Okay. I ignored him because he wouldn't give me my money. Not because, again, I have not had with him at all. But I was in a, a, a desperate situation, and I didn't want to continue the relationship if he wasn't going to help me out. You get what I'm saying? No, no, I went to see somebody in the lab. Who was where he, would you go see? My dude, who was from? Your dude? Where was your dude supposed to be? And what was your, did you meet up with your dude? I met up with him over on 6th to go get some weed. When answering the questions, Brian often looks up and takes a long time to respond. While this may simply indicate that he's thinking, it's also possible that he's taking extra time to conjure lies, especially since these events occurred only a few days ago and shouldn't be so difficult to recall. Do you guys end up getting any weed? Mm -hmm. Each one is in my pocket. It's in your pocket. Oh, yeah, we got a couple of baggies off. Look at the light of the f***ing center in my head. <laughs> Even as the detectives lighten the mood a little, Brian's demeanor doesn't change at all. Despite his seemingly calm appearance, he's probably extremely stressed, which is understandable considering he's being interrogated. He also has no interest in building rapport with the detectives. During Brian's 2010 interrogation for kidnapping, robbing, and assault that led to his previous six-year incarceration, he wasn't as calm and collected as he is here. Please note that the following clip has poor video quality. Let's talk about, let's talk about what we got the DVD player, Brian. And Brian, right I now... I told you what I got the DVD right player now, from. No, you didn't. Brian, it was about the car one. Stop, we're past that point. Okay? Dude, I got you on video, okay? We're not going to sit here and play this game anymore. I've got you on video okay. at the ATM after you freaking robbed the girl last night. You ain't got me on no video. I got you on video. You got me on video. You know, I robbed who all the way? You said rob somebody. Yeah. Man, you're crazy, crazy, bro. Did you took her DVD. She right. gave it to me, bro. Why would she give you? She me? gave it to me. Bro. Why would she give you? Man, me? she gave it to me. Why? Tell me why. Why? Man. She she's giving you a book already. So why is she going to give you the DVD player? She said she already had one, bro. What did you give her? She gave you a gave you two I some money. I was asking her for some money. We came in through the back way. I asked her for some money. After that, you know what I'm saying, we went to her house. We got in the house. I seen the bags in there. I'm like, oh, shit, let me have this. She's like, I don't even know what it is. I'm like, uh, but, oh, it's a DVD player. Let me have it. My birthday coming up in January. She says, okay, sweetie, you can have it. So I left after that. After she, then she went upstairs and gave me a came back downstairs, grabbed the bag, and then left. Why is she pissed? Why is she so pissed at you? She's not, I don't know. Why is she telling us different stories? That you robbed her last night. That you held her knife to her. Because I don't want to talk to her. Interestingly, one aspect of Brian's body language between the two interrogations is the same, crossed arms. This indicates that his arms hugging his torso is likely due to him feeling stressed about being interrogated, rather than a result of him being cold as he mentioned earlier. When someone feels threatened, they often withdraw their arms as a way to protect their body. Despite Brian's different approach to the detectives now, there are many similarities between this former case and Reagan Toke's murder. Besides the DVD player, what else did you take? That's it, bro. Her cash. How much money? She did you gave take? that to me. I did not steal that from How her. How much money did she, she give? She gave me forty dollars. How much did you spend on weed? Thirty-five. So you kept five dollars. Yes. All right. Now, when you got back to the apartment, the Mercedes pulls up. Tell me what's going on there when you guys are sitting there. Nothing. We all are. We all are fine having a conversation. She walked by. Come, she ain't say nothing to them then. She ain't say nothing to the, uh, to, hey, he's out here trying to do this and do that. Come on, man. Keep it real, man. I know. That's what I'm trying to figure out. That's what we're trying to figure it oh, out, too. Dude. We're trying to figure this whole thing out, too. Nah, man. It's not cool. 
I mean, no, you, y'all being a job is cool. Me, you guys get back to your partner. Why would she not say any female in their right mind if something was going on, bro? There were strangers or neighbors or something. She would have told them, man. Detectives are aware of this footage and the details of his previous case and take this into account when considering what Brian has to say during the current interview. We know what happened. We don't know why it happened. Tell me what happened. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me what happened. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, cigarettes or nothing. Well, that's what the cooperation is, yet, man. I, I, I don't know, know what he said. He said, I give him some. If you give me some, I haven't got nothing. I gave him a little okay. bit so far. I mean, we can... It's very suspicious that Brian hasn't asked who or what they're questioning him about as an innocent person would be concerned about this information. Furthermore, it's becoming clear to detectives that he will not participate unless he receives a clear benefit. This is actually something they can use to their advantage. But I want to, you know, I can yeah, call hey, inside and let me know what's going on. Let, and let, me, let me call my boss and see if I can get out from here. What's up with this stuff? I mean, I know that y'all's going to paperwork, but... Let me get the permission. Right. He probably won't. He probably won't allow you to put a whole cigarette. Let me get half of it. And then we can hit the rest of it later. Okay. Having determined that Brian will need additional motivators, the lead detective maintains some leverage by limiting him to half of the cigarette. That way, he has another bargaining chip later when he needs it. All right. You said we're good to go. Give me a minute. Let me get your pack. Uh, well, 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 can I? This is the second time that Brian's expressed interest in the documents sitting on the detective's desk. This is one of the first visible signs of concern he's exhibited so far. Got some? Come on, man. Catch you Officers provide Brian with a jumpsuit to keep him warm to gain additional goodwill, along with the promised smoke break. With the smoke break concluded, detectives return to the interview room with Brian. This is known as the turtle effect. Typically, this involves pulling the head down, raising the shoulders, and trying to be as small as possible. It usually occurs when someone is uncomfortable with the people around them or the situation they're in. Although some dismiss body language analysis as pseudoscience, it's used by the FBI and CIA during interrogations. When the CIA is interrogating an individual, they look for clusters of three or more indicators that occur in either quick succession or all at once. These indicators can be signs of discomfort or uncertainty in what the individual is stating rather than indicators of deception. It's extremely important to note that you cannot detect deception through body language analysis alone. This is where this cooperation thing is going to start or end. You know, I'm all this stuff right here. I know. I don't want to get you on. Straight up the phone. <laughs> You tell me, and then I'll show you what we have. Okay? How about you see the girl walking down the street? Start there. Well, what happened? You see her in the car? You see her in the car? See who? The girl. What? There's this pretty girl walking down the street on the road. What girl is the one? Right, the church is right here. So if you look down, that's High Street. That's where she would park. There's a, there's a bar down there. Right. So this is the church right here. See what I have circled right there? There's a video camera. Like okay. that? Pretty good. Cool. Yeah. So that's all I can, that's all I can see. Right now. Well, you, you, I give you a little bit. Remember how this works? I give you a little bit. I mean, hold on, hold on. I give you a little bit. And you give me a little bit. Uh, I, was, I was walking down that way. I was walking down okay. that way. I mean. But then, I know you did. But then you, 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 you saw the school. Okay. All right. Tell me about what happened there. Because you got the car with him. You just need the money, man. I get it. The secondary detective is attempting to minimize the crime and relate to him so that Brian will admit more. Is somebody hurt or something? Brian decides to play dumb here, seemingly unwilling to admit to anything until he has a better idea of what detectives really know. We just talked about this. Cameras. Ankle. Brian. 
just need some money. We get it. You need it to get back. To the you need it to get back to your place on the board. Accidents happen, then. Well, still not. Well, tell you tell us about her, all right? About what was going on, and then we give her a little more. Like I said, you're not here. You're not here by any accident. I know, I know, but I still <coughs> want to know what's going on. I mean, well, tell me about the girl. Tell me about why you got in the car with her. Did she invite you in the car? Here, Brian attempts to take control of the investigation and ensure that he doesn't confess to anything that he's not forced to admit. He seems to want to negotiate with officers, but his feigned confusion isn't very convincing. You got into the park, right? Yeah. And then you went down to Chase Bank. Mm -hmm. I heard through some withdrawals from the bank, right? And go get cameras down there as so well. You can get out very much. I need 60 bucks. Yeah. Uh, well, 60 bucks. <clears throat> Give me a little bit more. Okay. Then you need that. Save the receipts. Try to get 500 out. She didn't have it. <clears throat> Try to get 60 out. Or, you know, you didn't get 60 out. 60. Yeah, then there's $17 left. Then you chop it 200 and it was done. All right. So you got in the car, but we know that. Did she invite you in the car? Did she invite you in the car? That's what we're talking about. My cooperation is the way to go. Brian's admission that he wasn't invited into Reagan's vehicle is a large first step, and the detective praises him, encouraging further cooperation. It's interesting that he didn't try to make up a scenario where she invited him in, as this story paints him in a bad light, but perhaps he knew that wouldn't be believable given his criminal history. Did you drive or she drive? What was her reaction when he got in the car with her? Was she scared, nervous, upset? Did she like you? Did she think you were nice? Did you treat her right? Okay, and you told her you wanted what? Detectives have now established that he was, in fact, in the car with her and that he had an interest in robbery. Of course, they do have a lot of information from their research into the case and are mostly interested in Brian's admission. One tool at their disposal is CCTV. At 4.57 p.m., Reagan is shown leaving her home for her job at the Bodega Bar and Grill, where she'll work until her shift ends around 9.45 p.m. Meanwhile, at 7.08 p.m., Brian Goldsby boards a Central Ohio Transit Authority bus, which will take him to the area of the Bodega Bar. Notice that he's wearing a large, white, puffy coat. Near the end of Reagan's shift, she eats dinner at the bar and at 9.45 p.m. leaves, turning east on 3rd Avenue where her car is parked. GPS coordinates recovered from Brian's ankle monitor show that he'd been roaming the area outside the bar for some time before Reagan left work and the two intersected at the location of her silver Acura. Shortly after Brian's GPS picked up speed, indicating that he was now in her vehicle rather than walking around on foot. Did she have any cash on? No. So you told her to drive to Chase? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chase, around 10 o'clock, can you try? You need to be there. There's like a 30 minute delay. You try again. All right. What happens when that? Did y'all get some food or anything? She did a little action. Mm -hmm. she Detective Fournay's rather unexpected question here may be a reference to Brian's previous case. 
pointing out similarities between the two. Pretty girl, I mean. Even after the officers explain that they can see him pointing something at Reagan in the car, Brian denies ever having a gun. He may be concerned that he could find himself in far worse trouble than robbery if he admits to having one. Theft becomes aggravated robbery when a weapon is introduced. You, you had it in your hands. You know, it okay. Brian's ankle monitor GPS records indicated that before he was caught on CCTV boarding the Coda bus, he was in the vicinity of 17th Avenue. There he visited his girlfriend Hattie's family, even though she wasn't present at the time. However, Brian's denials about having a gun were about to fall apart. Leontay Brown stated that he was on his way to the house to see his girlfriend, Talia Nathan. He met Brian at a bus stop along the way and walked with him to the house. During this time, he claimed that Brian told him that he'd purchased a gun, although Leontay didn't see it. When they arrived, Brian texted Talia, Hattachey's cousin, to let her know they were there and she let them into the house. She explained that Brian took off the white puffy coat that detectives witnessed on the CCTV footage and put it on the couch. He then warned her that the coat had a gun inside so that she and Leontay's toddler son wouldn't touch it. At 6 o'clock p.m., Hattachey's aunt Tawana Richards arrived at the residence and attempted to move the coat off her couch, noticing that it felt heavy. Brian grabbed the coat from her, explaining that there was a gun in the pocket. None of the three actually laid eyes on the gun itself, but this conversation took place while Reagan was still at work, meaning that Brian had a firearm shortly before his encounter with her outside the bodega. So how much money did you get? That's it. And she had no tips, no nothing from where she was working? No. Okay. The day after Reagan's murder, Brian visited Tawana Richards' house again. While he was sitting on the couch, she observed him counting a stack of money, which she believed to be around $200. This money is believed to have come from Reagan's purse. Talk to you, man. I mean, you're being straight right now. Let's stay on that room. What is the, what is the... Okay. 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 So after Chase, after you leave Chase, where are you going next? Be truthful, where are you now? Okay. Did you get any money there? What, what was her own card wasn't working? Or she, was she putting her pen? I mean, it just rejected? She didn't have no money? What hunting did you guys do? Didn't work with the Huntington. Didn't work. Went back to Chase. Tried a different card. Great, right? Sixty dollars out. Then you decided to try the other card again, right? Uh, and didn't work. We're from there. We leave Chase. You want me? I'll throw a time reference out because we know what time. It was 10:33. Chase. Yeah, the second time. And y'all left together. Where'd y'all go from there? Brian's method of operation seems to be only admitting to information where he knows the detectives have video confirmation, such as at ATMs. He's touching his face often now, which is a self-soothing gesture often used when a person is feeling uncomfortable. And then there's a gap up till 1140 when I got you at Turkey Hill getting gas in Grove City. Is that right? 
Mm-hmm. Did you use a card? I didn't. She did? Mm-hmm. Did you fill it up? Okay. So now we're Chase, Grove City. It's only a 15 minute drive. Where's that whole hour go, man? I gave you something. No, I went, I went, I went, um, I went, um, It's during this period of time that the officers suspect that he assaulted Reagan, and Brian seems to have a clear understanding that making any admissions related to this incident can place him in significantly more trouble than only the kidnapping and robbery charges he expects. I had to let me out the car, and I had somebody pick me up. Brian has his hand in front of his mouth while he's talking, which could be a sign that he is being deceptive. People who are lying may hide their mouth in an attempt to cover the lie. Touching one's face can also be self-soothing during times of high stress. Brian, let's back up. Y'all, y'all not telling me nothing. Y'all not giving me a I just gave you turkey. You, know, you didn't give me nothing after. I, I, said, I, I, I said that. You, if, you, if you tell me, I'm, if you keep, I'm just going to guess. Y'all can keep you up. Well, well, some of the stuff is no. some, some of the stuff. In here, written. We don't have. I don't. I, I didn't make photographs of, of, yeah, of Turkey. I have a bunch of pictures. I do, but they're of different things. Okay. Okay, like. <clears throat> can I see the pictures? And I can. I can just tell you what's going on. Well, I don't know what he's got in there. You don't even know what I have in there. To be honest with you, I've been looking for you and all that, and I haven't been part of that part. It's becoming frustratingly clear to the detectives that Brian isn't going to present any new information on his own. He's determined only to commit to something when he knows they have irrefutable evidence. He has a lot of experience with law enforcement, which influences how he interacts with them. We're not to the point in the story yet where these other more media. If you lay it out, I'll explain it. If you, if you lay it out, I'll explain everything. Using the read technique of interrogation, detectives present a piece or two of evidence at a time and give the suspect time to build a story around that evidence. They then introduce another piece of evidence, especially when the story differs from what the detectives know to be true. Brian's stubborn refusal to play along is derailing their attempt to use the tactic to its full efficiency. So we have the receipts, all right? We have... Yeah, I'm not going to show you that stuff yet. I'm going to show you everything else I have here. This is the same stuff you're I know. Oh, I'm saying there's not much in here. You need to tell me where you drive around and where you, where you go next. This is your car. This is just... Yeah, Tony, he ain't got that much there, man. Yeah. You're all worried about that packet. I'm not. I'm not, it's not, I'm not too. It's, I'm talking about. This is pretty much stuff. This is the only thing I haven't seen is a picture of a car. Right. right. I mean. Well, let's, let's get there. I want to get there, man. All right. Jesus. I need to know about when you went to the park. I took the car left. No, you didn't. It was like you went. You went to side. You went to the side of the park. Took her for a car and left. Did you drop her off there? When the detectives don't produce any photos to suggest otherwise, Brian reinforces his version of events, although detectives know he's lying. So you just dropped her off there? Yeah. Then where did you go? Up uh, north. Um, well, yeah, no, west north. No, you didn't. I did go to west side. You stopped somewhere. Yeah, that's west side. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I thought you said something else in here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I, I thought you said something else. Yeah, he, went, he went to what? Westside. Where'd you stop at there? Uh, my dude's apartment. You stopped at a store, too? That was, I didn't get a chance to say to me, but yeah. Uh, what store did you stop at? Uh, I don't know the name of that gas station. Okay. If I said, would you not? After Brian's attempt to have the detectives put all the evidence on the table, the detectives methodically produce more photos to put him on edge, as he doesn't know what else they may still have. Hey, Gallon again. Mm-hmm. That's what this is. 
showing what you bought. Gas can. All right, so the little gas can you bought. Spout. That's over on Oakwood Avenue. And there's just another picture of the garbage. There's the gas can. As far as your pictures go, that's what I have. That's, right. have. that's not everything I have. That's what I'm saying. Photographs. No, listen, listen to me. Photographs. That's the photographs that I have. We have other stuff too. Let's back it up. Just notes and stuff. Brian seems excited when he believes that the detective has presented him with all the evidence, probably thinking he can continue to deny anything else. The detective is quick to assure him that he has more evidence than what he's presented as a countermeasure. From there, you go to the park. Mm -hmm. And you do what? what? What happens? You pull in there. Was the gate open, shut? What was going on in that park? The, the actual grounds were shut. Right. So you but pull in the entrance? Yeah. Okay. When you left there, you you got her out of the car. You get in the driver's seat from there. Yes. Right. You ever take your clothes off? No. All right. No. She takes them off then herself. I didn't have her do. I didn't have her take her clothes off. I did not have her take her clothes off. Was somebody with you? No. Okay. I didn't have her take her clothes off. As expected, Brian denies having anything to do with Reagan after supposedly letting her out of the vehicle. It's important to note that when the officers ask if anybody else was involved, he states that he was alone. What happens at the park? I leave. There you go. Um, yes, I do. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I leave. Okay. Um, yes, I do. This, this, is the, this is the important part. Okay. You, ever, you, you ever take your clothes off? Right? No. Just, oh, just, oh, just, just listen. All right? The detective shoots down Brian's denials here, which is part of the read technique designed to keep the suspect's confidence low, as often the more they are allowed to deny, the more comfortable they feel making those denials. You didn't mean to do this. Things got out of control. You panicked. I get it. I understand. You're not a bad dude, man. We're sitting here talking to you. You're not a bad dude. The officer moves to another read strategy trying to make Brian feel comfortable enough to make admissions by suggesting that what happened was an accident and that he's understanding. This is designed to make the suspect feel like there's no judgment, downplaying the incident. This offers him an out, making it easier to admit than saying the crime was done in a cold and calculated manner. Things spiral and get out of control quickly. We've been doing this job for many years, it happens. It gets the best of everyone, right? That's what you do. Brian shifts in his chair, likely a sign that he's feeling uncomfortable. When someone is sitting in a chair, they have three points that anchor them to that position, the back, feet, and buttocks. In an interrogation situation, when a suspect moves these parts of the body, it's likely a way for them to try and dissipate feelings of anxiety. All of a sudden, you're doing something, and it's going on, and you just think just get out of control. What is out of control? Out of control means you, you have to take the clothes off. It seems that when Brian asked what out of control meant, he was considering latching on to this suggestion that what happened was accidental. I just told you, I you get it, you understand. No, yes. you don't. I didn't have a check of clothes off. I've been honest with you so far, and you still haven't shown me the picture over there. It's just a fair. Hmm? It's just a fair. You don't want to see that, man. Yeah. No, that's that. What, what, what is this accident talk you talking about? Y'all keep talking about an accident. You shot it. I ain't shoot nobody, man. When's the last time you shot again? I've never shot a gun. Never. Never. Never, ever, ever. Ever. Why, why are we at this point here that you're stopping? What? We're at the point because I done gave you pretty much everything I know. Brian claims that he's giving them pretty much everything he knows. This is known as using an exclusion qualifier, and it can be an indicator of possible deception. By qualifying his statement with pretty much, he's able to give them some information, but not the whole truth. The interesting part about this type of lie is he's actually being honest. He's giving them pretty much everything he knows, except what he can't tell them. Brian's hands are open, palm side up, which is often interpreted as a pleading behavior. 
It indicates that he wants the detectives to believe he's telling the truth, even though he may not feel 100% confident about what he's saying. You, 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 you are, all right? You're being truthful and honest about everything so far, with the exception of this. So you let her out, right? And she is found naked and dead there the next day, all right? And you leave. It's freezing cold. Right. Listen, 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 you let her out, it's freezing cold out, and you leave. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. What's she going to do? I don't know what she does. She's going to get the hell out of there and run to the house. Listen, I don't. Listen, I, I don't know. Yeah, listen. Is that anybody in the right mind would do that. If, if she, she just went through all this. You let her out. She's going to go, she's going to run to the house. I don't know what she's going to do. Listen, I didn't shoot nobody. Man. You did. Brian doesn't even refer to Reagan directly when defending himself, choosing to say I didn't kill nobody rather than I didn't kill her or that girl. While he does use the pronoun her from time to time, it's never in association with her death. This may indicate that he's attempting to distance himself from her. Despite his anger at being accused, Brian shows no emotion or surprise whatsoever when he learns the fate of Reagan Tokes. This may be an indication that he already knows what happened to her, it could also be a symptom of antisocial personality disorder, or APD. People with APD have a much higher threshold for showing emotion or feelings and don't feel fear, worry, or guilt the way that others do, which is why some people are able to commit horrific crimes. It's important to note that, to our knowledge, Brian has not been diagnosed with APD. Well, what other explanation could there be? She's she and where you drop where you guys pull into the, the park, right? Okay. She's found the head naked right there. I what other explanation? Could I don't be? know about any other explanation or nothing. I didn't shoot nobody. Then. But what? I've never well, listen, shot listen, a gun in my let, life. Let's just let's just think this through for both of us. I mean, can we can we at least do that? I mean, I, I I'm not self-centered by any means necessary, you know, okay. but. You're telling me, you're trying to tell me that I've shot somebody and I didn't shoot somebody. I just told you everything that I, I even gave you this that I, with gas cans, because when I got the car, you know, I tried to burn the car because I had the car. But as far as me shooting somebody, I ain't shoot nobody. Man. For the first time, he offers an admission that was not dragged out of him in an attempt to distance himself from the idea that he murdered Reagan. However, expending the extra effort and taking the risks involved with burning the vehicle seems beyond what is necessary for a simple robbery. All right, so when she got out of the car, did, did you give her anything? Did you give her a phone? Did you give her what? Her, her purse, her, her coat? Did you give her anything? Well, I got rid of all of that. What did you do with that? Where's all that? I don't know that. Well, where's all that at? I need you to say that. You if you're saying that. you didn't shoot her, where's all that stuff at? You don't know that. Though. Well, that will prove you didn't shoot her. We know where you put the, her stuff. It's probably, it's probably gone by now. It's in the trash. Right, it's in the dumpster at Speedway. Dumpster at Speedway. No, I'm just guessing. No, but... What trash did you put? It was, it was somewhere. Once more, Brian takes extra time when trying to remember what he did with her belongings, something which should be easy for him to recall. Taking her belongings in the first place is another act which seems unnecessary if robbing Reagan was all that he'd done. Not only this, but the evidence would tell a shocking story. A Crime Stopper tip revealed the unexpected location of Reagan's purse described as a high-quality black purse with a red lining. According to the source, it ended up in the hands of Hattie Jackson, Brian's girlfriend. The source of the tip may have been Katherine Gayhart, Hattie's aunt, as she told officers that she'd submitted a Crime Stopper tip related to the purse. In that Crime Stopper report, the source alleged that Hattie took the purse, wiped off the blood, put her own stuff inside, and laughed about what happened to Reagan Tokes. Though this has never been confirmed, 
Did and you I see her with the purse? Yeah, yeah, okay. I did see her with the purse. Uh, I was here with my cousin while we were packing up their stuff. I wore gloves because before that I knew she had, I had heard and I, and I seen her with the purse. And so I didn't want my fingerprints on anything. So I wore gloves while I to pack up all her stuff. And she was talking all kinds of trash and mm -hmm. everything. And I seen her with the purse. That's when I took a picture, two pictures. Okay, of so you took the picture. Of and then I got, what, what she, day was that? Do you remember? Uh, it was, it was Valentine's Day. Okay. Uh, Tuesday. My sister, her mother, came and grabbed up the purse or whatever, and that's when we argued and everything. And I told her, I said, you know, you're dead wrong for, you know, having that young lady's purse and everything. And you knew what he did, and you knew his background, and you brought him around the family. So it was a lot of that. And we was down the street, and she said she was gonna call the police uh, if I hit her because I was gonna beat her up for for that. And I said, we'll call them because as soon as they show up, I'm gonna pointing directly at you and let them know that you have this young lady's purse. So that does not sit right with me, like, because she doesn't care what happened to that young lady. And I think it's bullshit, excuse my language, but that is bullshit. Yeah. This information certainly shed a bad light on Hattie Jackson. Detectives were very interested to understand her side of the story. How'd you get the purse? How's the time to be perfectly honest with me? The silence draws out before Hattie finally answers. When someone's response to a simple question is delayed, it can be a red flag of deception. The deceptive person is likely trying to think about what they're going to say. Someone who's being truthful would be able to respond right away. When he gave me the purse, he didn't show up to the house until 2 o'clock in the morning. What did he show up in? He showed up at my house. He gave me $60. Yes. He gave me sixty dollars and he gave me the purse. I was like, "Oh, babe, you didn't have to do this." And it had already had a pepper spray in it and some lotion, and I digged in it, and it had the wallet in it too. This would be the sixty dollars that Brian was able to get from Reagan at the ATMs. So I'm like, "Well, where's the gift bag? You know, where, where, where is that at?" So he's like, "Well, why are you unwrapping it to you? I just wanted to just, you know, give it to you like that." So I was like. Okay, whatever. It's incredible that among these other items, Hattie is able to discount a wallet inside the purse. After Brian told her, it was a new purse. What was in the wallet? You opened it up. Again, there's a long silence before Hattie responds. Another indicator of possible deception. Nothing was empty. Everything was empty. Everything was empty. There was nothing in that purse at all that was no, open. No business cards, nothing. The purse was empty. It looked like it was cleaned out. The only difference that I knew it wasn't all the way brand new is because it had that spot, like a lip gloss spot or something or a lipstick spot. And, and where do you say he got it? Macy's Target. Actually, but I was hers. She took the car back with hers? Mm-hmm. What, 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 what type of trash can you trash can you He's one of those uh, big metal joints. Where? Like an apartment dumpster? Yes. Well, what you tell me? Just a clothes. And? Oh, and her um, purse and stuff. Purse and phone. I'll be straight with you now. Okay. I just know it's there. Help me find it. Where's that? Can I get something else? What do you mean? I don't know. Well, I mean, what else you want? What else are y'all willing to give me? Because I know you're not going to give me everything. His request here is manipulative. A further indication that he's self-serving and wants to see what the detectives will offer him, rather than providing any information for the sake of being honest or helpful. Or is there a purse in there, too? Okay. Now, as far as me shooting somebody, can somebody explain to me? I didn't shoot the license. You just said that. Should I be going home? I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. I, don't know. I, don't know. I had her get naked, okay. and I got in the passenger seat, and I left. In his concern about being accused of murder, Brian slips up and admits that he did, in fact, have Reagan undress. This completely changes the story that he's been presenting to detectives. The detectives don't respond to this change immediately, and they focus on getting confirmation that he'd assaulted the victim. The lead detective reminds Brian that they have his DNA on file and that they found DNA inside her body. 
He asks if that DNA is going to be a match, and Brian states that it will not be his. Why'd you get her name? Just help me understand that. How did you make it so she wouldn't be able to go nowhere when I was being on? Like when you dropped her and left? You just didn't... You wanted her to be naked so she wouldn't know where to go? Or have nowhere to go? Yeah, I mean, as far as... Killing somebody, I ain't killing nobody, man. I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> so you're telling me you've never shot a gun? I've never shot a gun. Ever handle a gun? When investigators interviewed Callan Hartley, an acquaintance who knew Brian for a long time through the Department of Youth Services, they learned that he had actually met with him the day before the murder. And then he carried a pistol on him. When did you see that gun? Uh, I seen it all the time. It was a black, it was a black revolver. So your jacket, stuff is going to be collected. And I am pretty certain there's going to be gunshot residue. There may also be blood or DNA on his clothes which can help investigators with their case. And, um, positively certain there's not going to be no gun residue on there. Why, why, why everything? Why are you giving me everything? Because I, I did not kill nobody. Man. Banging his hand on the table is an exaggerated gesture to try to make him seem more believable. At this point, detectives more than likely have enough circumstantial evidence on all aspects of Reagan's murder but the defense would claim that someone else came along after he left her at the park and killed her. While unlikely, it's still possible that a jury could view this as sufficient cause for reasonable doubt. So the detectives want a confession. All right, let's, let's just hold on. Let's, 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 let's just go over your story. You pull in to the, the park, right, and the gate's closed, right? Is that oh, right? don't they got cameras out there? They should have cameras out there. They don't. Brian's entire demeanor changes as he references park cameras. More than likely, he already knew there were no cameras there, which is why he took her there to commit the atrocities in the first place. You shot her in the head, man. I didn't shoot nobody in the head, man. Don't you, I understand how this game works. I understand y'all have to jump. No, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about that. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me, let me rephrase that word. I'm not, I'm not I understand playing how this, man. I'm telling you, I truth. understand how this police investigation stuff works. You know. TV says good cop, cop, good cop, bad cop stuff, but you're you're still trying to get me to admit to something I didn't do. It. I've already admitted to taking her to the bank and having her get money out of the bank. You're, now you're trying to tell me that I killed somebody. I didn't kill nobody, man. Like many narcissists, Brian thinks he's smarter than he is and knows more than he does. Nonetheless, he does provide important insight as to how he views the investigation process. Brian is using more hand gestures and is sitting up right now, suggesting that his confidence has increased from earlier. He may believe that the detectives don't have enough evidence that he did more than rob her, so he's feeling relieved and more relaxed. Someone sees your car, a car parked at, at the same time that you're down there, okay. right? They don't think a whole lot about it because they, there's always usually a police cruiser sitting there, so they okay. think it's a police cruiser. Then they hear gunshots. Okay. At first, they think, well, maybe it's a game a ranger putting down a wounded animal or something, mm -hmm. and then the car leaves at the exact same time that you guys were there. You, you guys, like, okay, so let me, let me, you said, so somebody said that they, oh, no, would you say if somebody said that they did, what about the uh, hunting if someone If someone heard gunshots out there, mm -hmm. all right? Okay. How can, how can we explain that? This is an interrogation technique known as planting seeds of doubt. I couldn't tell you, man. I don't, I don't know nothing about no gun, man. I told you there's no cameras out there. Um, I know, but you know that like, whenever you go into something, they have a counter because they want to know how many people is going into the park, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, a box there, and it's called a clicker. And every time a car goes through there, it, it keeps track of it, okay. right? So at the time that you guys are in there, it says, yeah, hey, there's a car in there. And then the car leaves. Mm -hmm. And then there's no other car in until like 6 a.m. So the truth was no one else back there, man. There's no other car back there. So are you telling me that somebody can't walk on foot or... But yet you're still trying to go back to me shoot somebody. Mm -hmm. You keep telling me about this. I'm, you have a gun? You have, I mean, I didn't, you have all of this stuff 
your, your pictures of the gun is probably in there. Which you're probably not showing. If, I mean, if it is, then you probably would have showed me. You, you could say something to me right now about it. I Chinese. don't. This, I'm not, I, haven't held, I haven't held a gun in many, many years, man. Once more, Brian is fishing for information as to what evidence the detectives have so he can continue to make denials. How are your fingerprints going to be on? I, I bet it, my fingerprints don't be on no gun. What if they are? I know my fingerprints on a gun. I haven't held a gun in years. Brian. You're not hearing what I'm saying, man. I you're, have to, you're not hearing what I'm saying. I don't know what else you want me to give you, man. You asked me all of these questions and I told you everything. Nobody in their right mind is going to admit to nothing like this. When Brian taps on the table with his hand, he's using an illustrator to emphasize his point. However, when illustrators are mistimed, this can indicate possible deception. Brian's hand tapping on the table doesn't match up with the words coming out of his mouth. Illustrators should sync up to natural punctuation points, but Brian seems to be random and ends suddenly during the same sentence. Nobody in their right mind is going to admit to nothing like this. This use of an illustrator may be just for show and an attempt to make the detectives think he's being truthful. Because they know they're going to go to jail, man. Nobody in their right mind is going to admit to People do all the time. To, to a murder? Yes. No. This is a telling statement. He didn't say that an innocent person would never admit to it. So this is a good indicator of Brian's state of mind. It also indicates his major reason for not making any admissions is to avoid facing additional jail time. They know that they have all of all this, this, this overwhelming guilt of what happened. Look at this girl, man. Look at look look, look at her family. Look at this. That, that's her, right? I did not kill that woman. That's, that's her. No. The whole Ohio State community, man, scared The detective attempts to appeal to Brian's sense of guilt and remorse to try and gain a confession. However, this technique only works if the suspect isn't a psychopath or sociopath, which would make them unable to feel these emotions. Well, where we're coming from is you're, you were the last person with her in the car. The, you get Hold on. Can I talk? You're the last person with her, right? You know, you were with her. Last person we know that was with her, by your own mouth. You get her naked, which still doesn't make quite much sense to me, because you left her for dead at that point anyway. It's, it's freezing cold outside. Oh, dumb, but hold on, I'm talking. It's freezing snow outside. You put this young lady out of the car, because you don't want her to go nowhere, but why take her clothes? Makes zero sense to me. His partner tries a different approach, appealing to logic. His tone is becoming more aggressive as his patient seems to be wearing thin with Brian's obvious lies and denials. If, if it's cold out there, then, I mean, where, 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 where are you honestly going to go? I mean, I understand there's houses, farms, whatever. So you don't want her to go anywhere? You want her just to stay there and sit? I told her to stay there for 30 minutes, right? 30 minutes is a long time when you sub zero degree temperatures, buck ass naked. Why would a girl just take her clothes off? I just, it's I, cold. I told her to, though, you know? Right, how'd you tell her? I just, I said. Tell me the way you told her. I just said, I said, uh, I said, I said, um, you want, uh, you say you want to live. I don't, don't do nothing to nobody. I said, if you do what I say, then everything will be fine. I'm, you stay here for 30 minutes and you'll be free to go wherever you want to go. You're good to go. Yeah, and all that. And then she gets out. Buck neck has told you. You flip around the car. Yeah. You roll down the window. And you said, walk down there. And so I say, yeah. stop. And she was walking. She kept looking back. I said, stop. Yeah. All right. The detectives are trying to indicate to Brian that it's difficult to believe that Reagan would do all the things he asked of her without the use of a firearm. The, in the eyes of the court, and let me finish when we're going here. In the eyes of the court. You, I, and he both know an accidental is way different than somebody and lying and going all the way through hold on. Because you know what that looks like? That looks like you don't, you sure, that, that means there's no remorse. You don't give a shit. You're covering it up because you want to lie about it. Or there's an accidental where a goddamn gun went off. I didn't mean it to, it went off. This is another example of the Reed method. 
offering two alternatives, one of which is significantly less severe. By suggesting that it could have been an accidental discharge, he's trying to encourage Brian to latch on to that theory. If he does, they have culpability and can work with that. Accidents are accidents. When a jury looks at somebody and goes, that dude was straight up, it was a f accident. I want to help this man. Or they can look at you and go, this dude uh, dropped her off. I mean, y'all already. It's not me helping you, it's you helping you because I'm telling you that honesty is what helps you. The detective appeals to Brian's self serving nature to try to get him to confess. You're trying to, I, don't, I can't say cold horse because I signed a paper but tell, uh, pretty much get me to admit to something that I did not do. I gave you everything. I gave you everything I had. You didn't give us everything. I did not kill nobody. Yes, I did. I gave you everything. I didn't kill nobody, man. I did not kill anybody, man. You did? I did, man. I did. I, I told you multiple times I did. The only thing that I, I worked, you know, I did. All right, man. So it's going to be that's up to interpretation. The detective begins packing up his investigation materials to create a sense of urgency. All the while, he continues to imply that no one will believe his story to try to get Brian to open up about what really happened. You realize that? I mean, um, it's going to be that's up to anyone with a sensible mind putting. Two plus two together and saying, well, holy shit, who else could have killed her? No one. Can I say I told look? That's all I get. Can I say I told look? It's going to look like this. Leaving him alone with a single detective is another tactic to try to get a confession. A one-on-one -on -one situation is a lot less threatening, so he may be more comfortable about revealing the truth. What about, you said you tried to burn it. How did you try to burn it? Gasoline. All right, you pour gas all over the damn thing. No, can spilled out in the uh, in the back of the trunk. Oh, okay. So why did the house spout end up up on the yard? Oh, I just throw that comment. Tired of it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> how how'd you try to light it though? I mean, where'd you try to light it? Right there. I mean, you like the you like the trunk, the back seat, passenger seat, driver seat. Where'd you light it? Passenger seat or driver seat. How come he didn't keep going? You couldn't get a car to light on fire with it a gallon of gas? gasoline in there and spilled all in the back seat. Why didn't you light the back seat? I didn't think of that. Well, what it, what it looks like right now is even if you didn't shoot her, you still left a young 20 year old lady naked in a field in the freezing cold in the snow. You left her for dead. She wasn't gonna live either way. Is that, is that fair? Yes. No, I Get anywhere? No, I mean, he, he understands that he left her for dead out there in the field and was up okay. by the nakedness. He, he understands that. That was something that I shouldn't have done. I probably should have left the letter keep her closed, you know? The palms of Brian's hands are up as he's talking, which may be an attempt for him to look trustworthy. This behavior is almost pleading. He's asking for the detectives to believe him that he knows he shouldn't have left her naked. But why'd, why'd you lie to me about the clothes earlier? You lied. You said you didn't get her naked. You fought me for a couple minutes on that one. You did. Oh, and goodness. then the next thing you know, is you slipped up and said, I found them in a dumpster. Then I'll talk, talk about somebody that killed somebody. Now, hold on, let me get this out there real quick. Hey, you know. hey Brian, Brian, let's, let's just talk about this, Brian. Now that the lead detective is returned, they confront Brian about his previous lie. Investigators have to carefully choose the timing to handle inconsistencies to ensure that suspects don't get defensive and shut down. You get out there, right? And, and you can sit there and say, no, 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 but that's not the case. You get out there, something happens. All right, you shoot her. Right. Listen, listen, you shoot her, but she doesn't die from the gunshot. She dies from the cold air, the freezing cold temperatures. So right. people, people get shot and doesn't die. It happens all the time, man. You would be 
There, there was a guy the other day, the guy shot 15 times and lived. It happens all the time. Yeah, so just listen. Let's just, let's just look at that, all right? I know that you shot her, but maybe the cold air killed her. Maybe the freezing temperatures did. This new story is yet another attempt for detectives to get Brian to admit to a smaller wrongdoing so they can gain some ground to see greater results. That's Mother Nature, man. That's, that's, that's out of your control. Something happened. She got shot. Cold temperatures kill her. That, that's, that's a possible thing that could happen. The detective becomes more emphatic pressing Brian over and over, trying to get that confession. However, Brian maintains his calm demeanor. The only thing y'all haven't did yet is beat me up and try to force me. Do you to really think we're going to do I'm that? I'm not saying, man. I'm just trying to get you to explain or get you to understand that I did not shoot And I'm you. trying to get you to understand that that doesn't make sense. So I want to go back to one other thing. What makes no sense to me is she's driving a car to chase. You're not, you're not that intimidating. I don't mean to say that to be rude, but this girl had plenty of chances to get the f away from you. How'd you keep her there? How? I, I, I said all I wanted was the money and everything would be all right. Right. But eventually, after she had a chance to run and turn to you. Right. After an hour, after two hours of being with her. She's worried and she's scared. She's got to be scared that this ain't going to work out for her and I don't know why she didn't run. car pulled up right next to us. Where? Where? Parsons. The only... Uh, okay. And she didn't do anything, right? No. The only reason somebody would not most likely do something is if they had a gun to them. The detectives hope they can finally wear him down by providing logical explanations to counter Brian's arguments again and again. And unless the, some, there's an alien that came out of the sky and shot her in the head, but we know that's not the case. We know there's no other cars that came in there. I know that none of this is going to look good when I go to court. I know no, that for a fact. You're, you're right. So what is, the, what is the point in me holding it back? I'm a straight honest guy. I'm a straightforward guy. I told you everything that I know. How'd you control her the whole time? I did, I did, from the beginning. How'd you get her car? Did you? Nothing. I just actually opened the door. She opened the door. No way. No way. No way, man. This does not work like that. You have the camera right? You have the pictures of the camera. I don't have the audio, though. So, so you see me go up to her then, right? You asked her to open up what door? Her, her door. I said, open up the back door, please. Did she just open I got it? in the back door, yes. No. You got in the back seat? Yes. No way, dude. <laughs> Nobody does that. Especially a young college girl. Brian's addition of the word please when abducting Reagan seems particularly ridiculous. He's probably trying to paint himself in a positive light to the detectives. Regardless of the fact I'm going to jail, just to, just from my history, I say, just from my history alone since I was young, um, without this murder, because I know that's going to be on the indictment, because that's what y'all question me about. Without that, I'm still looking at about 15, 20 years. Tell me. Just between, just between, just, 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 just the robbery and uh, the kidnapping alone. Right. What, what happened? What happened in Brian's life to make you do the things that you've been doing? What you mean? You, 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 the mistakes that you just said that you've done, right? Between, what, what happened in your life to make you choose those paths? As Brian muses about his future, the detective sees an opportunity to get him to analyze his actions. In doing so, maybe he can learn something useful. The detective may also be trying to give Brian an out or an excuse for his actions. If Brian reports that he had a history of trauma, the detectives may encourage him to blame his difficult past as a reason for why he did what he did to Reagan. It's usually easier for someone to admit to doing something horrible if they can find someone or something else to blame. 
it's important to note that there is some truth behind this. People who commit terrible crimes often do have a history of abuse, and that trauma they experience likely did have an effect on the person they became. However, most people who experience trauma as a child do not go on to commit murder. So childhood abuse and neglect alone can't fully explain why some people choose to kill. Were you abused as you were younger? I really don't want to get into that, but... Were you have a drug addiction? As far as... Is there a drug addiction? I smoke weed, everybody. I, uh, I know. know. No. No. Heroin? No. Crack? No. Cocaine? No. Meth? No. Anything? So you're not addicted to any no, drugs? I might, I might drink maybe once a month. So no drugs, you're not addicted to alcohol. So why do you make these choices to do what you do? No money. You said you're working. Don't get paid enough. You can do the money that you make. <laughs> spend it on weed. Spend that much on weed? How much do you spend on weed? I smoke a lot. How much do you make on weed? Roughly $256. I work your ass off for that, didn't you? This show of sympathy from the detectives is designed to help them build rapport, to try to change the paradigm and get Brian to see them as allies rather than the enemy. Despite Brian's claims of not having money, evidence seems to indicate otherwise. Jennifer Nickel, the mother of one of Brian's children, and her friend Brittany Ra came to the police station to provide evidence as they encountered Brian during this time period and shortly after the murder. He had like $700 the day, two days before that. He was working. He was working. And I, <clears throat> I came over to Jennifer's one morning and he had money and he was like, let's go get stuff for the kids. I want to go get the girls some outfits. So I took him to Walmart and he bought the girls some outfits and stuff, <clears throat> you know? And I'm like, Brian, I'm so proud of you. Like you are totally changing your life around. Mm -hmm. I couldn't be more proud of you. Good job, B bro, big bro. That's what I would always say to him, you know? This, this is what's gonna happen, right? Because we're gross and we continue investigating until the very end, all right? We're gonna find a gun. We're gonna find some friends in there, somebody that's gonna say, hey, I saw him with a gun. Because you know as well as I do, as soon as one of your friends gets picked up on some little b misdemeanor marijuana charge, right? They're going to tell the truth. I don't have friends. I'm just telling them. I keep it with family. Somebody is going to tell her that they saw Brian with a gun. This is another example of the interrogators planting seeds of doubt in Brian's head. Leonte Brown, Talia Nathan, and Tawana Richards all indicated that he had a gun that night, although they never saw it. His friend, Callan Hartley, stated that Brian had won all the time and that he had seen it. However, the most incriminating statement comes from his own girlfriend, Hattie, during her interview. Her story picks up just after Brian has given her the purse. He's showing me a gun, and his friend was there. What, what, okay, what kind of gun did he show you? A little, I don't know, it's a handgun. Okay, do you know? It was like, about this length. Do you know what a revolver is? But not like this. That's a nine. Well, I mean, this is like a semi-automatic gun. A revolver has a big round chamber. It's silver, right? Yeah, it's silver, but it rotates like this. Yeah. Kind of like the old gun. Yeah. That? Is that what he had? Okay, so he had a revolver. Why did he show that? Do you have any idea? I don't know. What did he say? He said that he needed protection. I said protection from who? He said, well, you know these nowadays. How did y'all, how did y'all even know to look for me? We know to look for you. Okay. You want to know how? Mm -hmm. DNA from the car. My DNA? Yep. Tell me the truth. Okay. You have a cigarette about in there. Oh. I'm, I'm being honest with you. And, 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 and that's what you were just telling me about the... You, would, you didn't want to get everything. The hand in this too. But you would, without the, D, without yeah, the we, cigarette, y'all wouldn't have had that. Yeah. You know? Well, we, no, we had this before. We had this before. We had the cigarette. Uh -huh. That's what I'm saying. What, before, see, that's what I'm, before that, how did you know to look for me for a robbery? We had the photographs of that speedway, right? And then the DNA. That's 
before you behind the gas, gas can. can. The gas can. Oh, so y'all found the car. I found a guy came in the car, mm -hmm. and you found out where it came from. Yeah. Brian seems particularly interested in the process the detectives used to find him. However, detectives gained a lot of evidence through their interviews with people close to Brian. Several of these people saw Brian driving the silver Acura after Reagan's disappearance. The day after the murder, Tawana Richards arrived home from work at 6.15 p.m. She noticed that the silver Acura was out front. Once inside, she asked Brian if he could drive Leonte to Don's quick stop so he could get her some cash from the ATM. As they climbed inside the vehicle, Brian told him that the Acura was his. From the front passenger seat, Leonte glanced in the back seat and noticed that there was dark-colored clothing on the back seat. It was possible that this clothing belonged to Reagan Tokes and that Brian later disposed of it. Leonte was not the only one who joined Brian inside the vehicle that day. He took it over to Jennifer, the mother of one of his children's house, where she and her friend Brittany Ruh were present. Here's Brittany's explanation of what happened. He came over to the house and he was like, I bought this car. We were like, what? You bought a car? And he was like, yeah, I just bought it from a dude of mine. I'm like, Brian, that's really awesome. Now you just need to get an apartment. And he was like, come down, look at it. So we went downstairs and I seen the tampon in the back door. And I told him, I'm like, that is so nasty. Yeah. And he was like, oh, my dude, he must have banged a girl back there. And he took the tampon and threw it on the ground. And we got in there and he turned the car on. And I was like, dude, this smells like gas in here really bad. According to Reagan's roommate, Stephanie Regale, Reagan had been on her period that week. Hattie also saw Brian in the silver Acura. Okay, what did he show up there in? How'd he get there? Um, his friend drove him. He said that he came with his friend, but he had dropped his friend off. The possible existence of Brian's friend during this time may prove important during his interrogation. So I said, well, where is your friend now? And he said that his friend was at work and he had a car. He parked it in my auntie's driveway. So you had to see it, right? Mm -hmm. About what color? Um, it was 2 o'clock in the morning, so I believe it was like silver. Where did you guys go? To McDonald's. Which McDonald's? Um, Cleveland. This would explain the McDonald's receipt and napkins detectives found inside Reagan's vehicle. Everyone who entered the vehicle with Brian pointed out that it smelled strongly of gas, evidence of his attempt to burn the vehicle. The detective wants to know if this was the case when Hattie was in the car with him as well. He said, oh, I got the gasoline in the back just in case I run out of gas. I said, we'll go to a damn gas station. You have, you know, he's like, oh, I don't want to stop. I said, why wouldn't you want to stop? And I said, you know, I just forget about it, and I gave him a kiss, and I left. Further questioning revealed that she and Brian had both smoked in the vehicle, although she threw her cigarette butt out the window. Brian's discarded cigarette butt was what allowed the detectives to discover his DNA inside the car. As a last-ditch effort to learn more, the detective becomes confrontational with her. There's nothing else you want to say. Now we got your DNA, you could be held up on a felony for tampering with evidence. You're trying to get your son, right? What else do you know? I know what you're trying to do, detectives. I have nothing to do with this murder. I'm a good girl. I know, but you're know, carrying around the person who the girl is murdered. Yeah, that I just found out two days ago. I know. Let him explain to you murder. Murder is murder. You did it on purpose. It's 25 to life to death penalty, whatever you want to go. Manslaughter. It's an accident. You're talking a couple of years. I mean, you'll get more out of robbery and the kidnapping than you would for a manslaughter. Well, for that, so right. Yeah. Well, no, it probably runs concurrent, to be honest with you. But we don't know. We're not the judge. We're not the sentencing person. But there, the, the, you see the difference in the charges. I've been, I've been incarcerated for in this the penal system for a very long time. It's rare. Right. It's, 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 it's rare that somebody gets manslaughter, but... As Brian has seemed concerned about his potential sentence, the detective tries to get him to believe admitting to an accidental killing will not cost him any additional time to try to get him to budge. Once more, Brian uses his extensive incarceration experience to counter his argument. We go to the judge. The judge... Now, this is hypothetically speaking. I go in there... 
they say they charged me with murder. I charged me with um, yeah, because you said that there was some DNA found in her. No, he said that. fluid. No, fluid. DNA is the same thing. It could be her fluid. I don't know what the could be her. I, mean, I, mean, I, I think of possibilities. Right. right. You know what I mean? Right. I, 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 I think about the future. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because that, that's what it's going to try to play out to. Her, she was naked, so and robbery. And kidnap them, so that's four charges just and there alone. They're going to build that up. So and and we're going to charge with murder. I just said that. That's the first thing I said. Okay, I'm sorry. I just want you to be clear. Know. You're going to be charged. Yeah, with yeah, yeah, he said he's, it's yeah. actually going to be aggravated murder. Yeah. And then that's more than that. That's right. more than correct. Murder. Correct. That's first degree. Correct. So go in front of a judge. All of these charges together. Y'all telling me y'all only can give me a few years. So I'm not telling you a few years. I mean, I know that. I'm not, I'm, 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 I know I'm, you I'm, don't make it. Hold up, hold up. I was making an explanation to you what, what, what the difference is between murder and manslaughter. Brian's hypothetical situation isn't something an innocent person would even be considering in his circumstances because they know they actually didn't commit the crime. Despite his incredible knowledge of the possible charges and sentences he faces, he doesn't seem to realize that he's incriminating himself. There's no doubt in our minds that you shot her. But we need to know why you shot her. I didn't shoot nobody. You did. Brian, you did, you did, you did, and you know it, man. Brian puts his head in his hands here, indicating that he may be losing his resolve. When detectives see body language indicators such as this, the procedure is to apply more pressure to try to get them to crack. And you know it. Well, we need to know why. That's all I care about. So I can call the family up and say, all right, this is this is what happened, and this is why it happened. And you, 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 you want me to say yes? I want you to tell me the truth, man. I'm telling you the truth. If you want me to say yes, I'll say yes just to get this all out the way. He knows that detectives can't accept a confession of that nature, so this is likely a ploy to get them to end the interrogation. You're not going to come, you're not going to tell me why, so I can let the family know. I told you I didn't do it, man. I, I so maybe I should go ask the deer on the woods on why it happened. It's not making any sense. I know it. I know oh, it. What? No, I was about to. I was, I was just. You no, know, I give you everything that I know, and yeah, you you, you be sarcastic with me. I'm not being like so, no, no, no. Be yeah, ask the deer. Ask the deer. Snap you, you're, you're right. I, I, I mean, I can't do anything. Because I'm getting, 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 I can kill Have you ever been outside in the freezing cold? I used to live out in the street. Okay. Man. Are you going to stand out in the freezing cold? When I cold? got out of the joint this trip, I didn't have nowhere to go. Are you going to be out there freezing cold? Are you going to stand out in the freezing cold, sub zero temperatures, in the freezing cold, okay. naked? No. After over two hours in the interrogation, Brian seems to be wearing down and becomes emotional. Whether this is an indicator that he's close to confessing or if he's just putting on theatrics to appear more convincing is unclear. Tell me why. Tell you why. Why, why you I, shot her? I didn't shoot nobody. Ryan, you shot her and you, you know that you did. Mr. And I don't know why you're not telling us. Mr. Rick, I didn't shoot nobody. I didn't shoot nobody. I gave you everything that I know. Sit out for a while. Come on, Brian. Detectives are now aware that Brian is not going to confess. Frustrated, they end the interview until they can decide what to do next. Brian held his composure with the detectives for the better part of two hours. Here, he looks distressed and exhausted. You stuffy? Yeah. I got a after a 10-minute hiatus, they call for Brian again, this time with a new approach. This case may sound straightforward so far, but just wait. 
Brian will soon reveal one of the most bizarre stories we've ever heard in an interrogation in order to try and explain what happened to Reagan. Bought me in here to shoot me. What? Bought me in here to shoot me. Nah, that's yeah, Rick. No, I, I wanted to go over one thing because there's one hole that I don't want, that I think might be a possibility. When you picked her up on third, when you were smoking weed with your buddy up on third in the alley, where'd you do, where'd your dude go? Mm -hmm. Back again, you said you were with your dude. Probably went back home. 100% he wasn't in that car with you. Um, at some point, we'll see if there was a second person in that car, and if he's the one that pulled the trigger, then, then we need to know that. No, in that case, I would still be an accomplice to all of that. No, I'm the only one that was in the car. The detective seems to be providing a way out by offering someone else to blame. Once more, Brian gives a suspicious answer that shows that his concern is still only for himself. You sure? Nobody else. Even if you take away the accomplice, if there was somebody else in the car that he pulled the gun and you said no, then whatever. You know what I mean? Brian sits in silence for a long time, contemplating this scenario and its implications for him. The detective notices this. You didn't want to hurt nobody. You're not violent. You're not violent like that. But I think. One way you could have controlled her was with a second guy. And you don't want to give me the name of the guy because you don't want to be a snitch. If he can get Brian to latch onto this story and admit that he was there when Reagan was killed, it will prove he was lying the whole time and open the door to presenting him as the only shooter later on. I need to know if there was a second dude in the car. He's the one that, he's the dumbass that pulled the trigger. He's the one that did all the damage. The silence stretches on. That motherfucker, if he was in the car, he caused the to be a death, not you. Yeah, you wanted money. You were out there to get money. If there was a second dude in the car, now's the time to tell it. So I can start doing that it's right route. It's not going to make a difference. It does make a huge difference. It's not going to make a difference because in a long run, I'm still going to prison. Man. I'm still going to prison. Man. Why you going to lie to me now? Because it's not going to make a difference. You haven't lied at all all night, and now you're going to lie to me. Because it's not. It does make a difference. I want to know. It's not going to make a difference. Man. I want to know. The detective switches his relatively calm demeanor to suddenly yelling and cussing at Brian. Though yelling and cussing at a suspect is generally not a great tactic, and remaining calm and respectful but slowly getting more confrontational is a better route, he may be employing this strategically to keep Brian unsure and uneasy. This is typically called the fear up tactic. Well, it kids ain't gonna die, dude. Well, the kids ain't gonna die. We can look out for them. Brian appears to be having an emotional meltdown now which makes sense after nearly three hours of interrogation. He still shows no remorse for the victim or the crime itself. On the other hand, he may still be putting on an act to make the story he plans to tell more convincing. Okay. We, can, we can look out for them kids. We can look out for you, for you girl. No, man, people being... I already got people up there at your girl's house, your baby's mom's house. No, you don't. No, don't lie to me, please. Right now? Don't do that. Please don't lie. They're up there keeping an eye on it right now. Don't do that. Don't because it's the second month in that car, and you need to tell me who the f he is. The detective raises his voice, likely to put additional pressure on Brian. However, his anger appears to be on Brian's behalf toward this supposed unknown person in the car, which is intended to encourage him to trust and confide in him and make it appear that he believes Brian's story. This is the only thing I have left, and I'm not even going to have that because I want to go back to prison because she doesn't want to... You're going to have that because you ain't going to get it because you're going to tell me who the f shot this girl. She doesn't want to be with me if I if I'm being up there that man. She doesn't want to be with me, man. So I'm already going. If I go, back, I'm going back to jail anyway. So I'm losing everything anyways, man. Help yourself out. Be the stand up man. Tell me who the other who tell for that girl's family. God damn it! You talk about your family. That poor girl's got a family too. No, man. As Brian continues to bemoan his own situation, the detective tries to get him to remember that he's not the victim here. This motherfucker shot her. Who was it? Listen, man. Listen. 
I was. Who was in the f-ing car with you? I'm not doing nothing. I want to know. Who pulled the f-ing trigger, Brian? If I didn't bring me money back for him, he used to know me. I used to go to school. Mm-hmm. That he was going to kill me. You and your family. Your family. All right. That's all I got left, man. I don't have nothing. All right. I got a f- life in shambles. I, I, I don't I know need you. this, man. I know you I don't. don't need this, man. All I wanted to do was take care of my kids and make sure that they were cool and provide for them. That's why I was working. I ain't never held a f- job as long. Now I'm f- lost out on my goddamn job. So did he? Did he tell you to go out and get a girl? Huh? Did he? Whose idea was it to go get the girl? <coughs> Brian's cough could be an adapter sign of stress as he tries to release some nervous energy about his new story. It wasn't to specifically get a specific person. It was to get money. Yes. How much money did he expect? He told me he needed about $2,000, $3,000 to my or he's going to go my family. So. Okay. Like a week and a half ago, it was the first time I've seen him. It. And it, it's like it, it was his mandatory thing. See, I was, I stopped going to work. I was scared. Mm-hmm. I started, I wasn't even, I, there was times I wouldn't come home until 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. Right. So, and I can't let my mom know. Right. She's going to move and leave she me anyway. Right. She's going to break you out. You know what I mean? Right. So right. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make sure that everything is cool. Everything you asked me to do, bro. You did? I did, bro. Just leave me f- leave my kids alone, bro. Well, I wanna there was some days, bro, I bought you two, three hundred dollars, bro. Just leave me the f- alone. So you were giving him one, two hundred dollars at a time. Uh, yeah, sometimes I don't even have my checks sometimes, bro. Well, let's get this. Let me lock his ass up. I don't know his f- name. I don't even know how he knows my baby mom. Brian is quick to play the victim, and the detective plays along to keep him talking. None of the story makes sense and is unrelated to the crime he committed. Hattie did mention that Brian had dropped off a friend before coming to see her at 2 a.m., but he may have been lying to her. You were driving was in the back seat. Behind her? Yeah. Or no, behind he, you? He was behind her at first. Okay. And then he went behind me. He had us go pick him up from out east. Did he call your phone? He was, is there going to be a phone call from him? Mm-hmm. No phone. He told me to a time limit. If I didn't show back up in an hour, it was over with. Where'd you have to go? I had to go out east again. My one year twenty second. Mm-hmm. I had to go get him. Aware that the bank security footage would reveal there was no second man, Brian makes sure that in his story, he picks the man up afterward on the way to the park. When the detective questions him about the phone call, Brian is quick to point out there wasn't one, as it would be traceable. The detective knows this story is a complete fabrication, but he wants to get to the events surrounding Reagan's murder so he can prove that Brian was actually there and had knowledge that no one but the murderer would possess. Couldn't get no money out of it. So, we left. Mm-hmm. Went back to Chase. Mm-hmm. Just you and her? Yeah. At this point, I'm scared of that. She's, she's wondering... While I'm doing this, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm good. Right For a good portion of the interrogation, Brian has sat very still with his arms wrapped around his chest. However, now his use of hand gestures has increased as he tells this new story. Any deviation in behavior from how the suspect was acting in the beginning of the interview is important to pay attention to and could indicate that they are lying. But she's wondering, like, she's like, just, can I just go home? I'm like, I said, baby, I wish I could, but I, I can't. She said, why? I didn't tell her, but I just, I wanted to, I wanted to just run and call the cops, for real. This is particularly unbelievable, especially because of Brian's previous relationship with the police and his disdain for them. So, he's like, I want you to meet me at this park. Ten minutes, if you're not here, all I have to do is make one phone call. I said, all right. We'll be back. Go to, and this is where I think that. Well, I really, when she picked him up, the 
first time she looked at me like I was crazy. Like, okay, he told me to stop here. And was, why, why is he getting in a car type look? So, <clears throat> but when, she could, when we dropped him off, when we went to go get the gas. You dropped him off where? Park. You dropped him off at the park? We dropped him off at the park. By himself? By himself. It's odd that they would drop off the man before going to the gas station and Brian doesn't give a proper explanation. More than likely, he's aware that the stranger wouldn't show up on the footage at the gas station and just wants a way to explain that. We go to the gas station and I promise him this way, but everything's going to be all right. Right. All he wanted was fun. Does she believe me, man? Throughout this new version of events, Brian presents himself and his behavior in a more positive light and much more meek and scared, which is at odds with how he handled himself with detectives for the first two hours. You get down to the park, what happens? We got there. He says, you get out. To I'm him. Like, oh, to me. I'm like, what's up? He says, you take off all your clothes. I'm like, well, what is you doing, bro? He says, we'll let her go. He's like, bro, shut the fuck up. I'm like, fuck <laughs> Out of the car. I, actually, I get out of the car first. Then she gets out of the car and she takes her clothes off. He says, You driver's seat. I said, Okay. You get out, go to the driver's seat. He falls, her. You get behind her. She got her hands up. He shoots her back in the head the first time. She falls. He shot her again when she landed on her car. He shot her inside of the f***ing head, bro. That is the first time I've ever seen somebody get killed in my own f life, dude. She f***ing shot her while she was, she was already, she shot her once in the back of the head, dude. It's much easier for Brian to explain the events of the murder as a witness than if he had to admit that he was the one pulling the trigger. Why the f***? <laughs> and then Neil had a nerve to tell me that if I say anything to anybody, then my family is going to be hurt, bro. So this is, that's why I gave you everything that I, I mean, I knew this part. Right, you feel me? Right, right. This is why I didn't want to tell you in the first place right. about this, because right. it's not going to stop now, because I'm about to be on the news. Brian is looking directly at the detectives now, likely trying to gauge their reaction and see if they're buying his story or if he needs to add additional details to make it more believable. He's gonna know that I talked to y'all. He can't touch me right now. While Brian attempts to cover the whole story with his fabrication, there are many inconsistencies, a few of which include Reagan's assault in the car and how he ended up with the money that he later gave to Hattie. After all, the whole point of the excursion was supposedly to get the other man the money. You know, but he can go get my family, bro. What kind of gun did he use? I don't know. It was silver. That's all I know, bro. It was silver. That's all I know. <laughs> was it square, round, old, like a... Describe it to me. It, it, it was... A, all I know was a revolver. Okay. So he, he goes up, shoots her in the back of the head. Yeah. He, As she's walking? He, he, there was two guns. Okay. He, he gave me one. Yeah. That had two bullets in it. Right. Mm -hmm. And his was fully loaded. And he had, a, actually it was three guns. He had another one in his pocket. And Because he had one at her and one at me. As he attempts to add details to make the story more believable, he's actually making it more far-fetched. This is common when people are lying. His introduction of a second gun and even a third is a bit outlandish and suggesting that the mystery man held him at gunpoint as well seems to be an attempt for Brian to imply that he too was kidnapped and a victim right along with Reagan. All he wanted me to do is do everything that I, that I told him to do. But I don't understand why he killed her, though. You know what I mean? She did everything he asked, bro. Right. And he shot her in the back of the head, bro. I literally see from sitting in the passenger seat looking at her hair. It was like some slow motion. Like, it is eerie to watch his emotion, real or fake, as he responds with disgust, describing actions that he himself performed. I don't know what the f I do, man. And then he walks up and gets in the f passenger seat. No, I fear she turned her back in head. Is she walking at this point? Okay, look. Or is she kneeled down? Or what's going on? I'm going to 
tell you, now I'm going to combine the story I told you earlier and this story together. Brian's location during this story is inconsistent. A minute ago, he said he was told to sit in the driver's seat. You know, go to the driver's seat. Then he was watching from the passenger seat. I literally see him sitting in the passenger seat looking at her hair. Yet when the murderer returns to the car, he sits in the passenger seat, which is where Brian stated that he was watching from. And then he walks up and gets in the passenger seat. Brian backs up, retelling the story for the detective. This time, however, he explains that the man took back the gun he gave to him and used it to kill Reagan, probably as a preemptive measure to explain away him having handled the gun. After he got 71, he told me to get out of the car. I just dropped the keys to his way. But he doesn't. He starts wiping the car down. So he starts wiping the car down, gets out. He pretty much wipes everything down. Including this part in his story is designed to explain why the other man's DNA or prints weren't found in the car. However, cleaning with a towel is insufficient to remove evidence of a person's DNA. I'm going to make you burn this car. I said, I'm not burning no car. No. He said, I'm not burning this car. I said, where? He said, I'm going to burn this car. So, I'm going to burn this car. Where? I can't think of the life for the life of me. What these names of these apartments was, man. Mm. What he told me to drive around for. What's he go by? What names he go by? TJ. TJ is the black guy, tall, skinny, fat, brown. He ain't. He ain't fat. He's like. I really got if he's about five eleven, six foot, roughly like two ten, two twenty at the most. Despite denying he knew who the man was earlier, Brian answers rather promptly here and even provides a description. Perhaps he now has someone in mind that he doesn't like, or that he knows as a plausible criminal to use as a scapegoat. Even though they suspect that the man is fake. Investigators still must follow through with their investigation. They asked those they interviewed about TJ. Do you know anybody named TJ? I know plenty of them. Are black or white? Black. The only TJ that I know would be black. Light skin? I don't know. Supposedly maybe has a cross tattoo right here. Okay. One time he said that he had a second person in his head. In his head? In his head. He told you that? He told us that. Did he say what that person's name was no. or anything? Did not say a name. I think it's a TJ if there is a second person because still to this day, like that, that day, he still won't tell us no detail on TJ. TJ. Does he, so <clears throat> how do you know about TJ? When all of it happened, mm -hmm. um, Detective Stellar, mm -hmm. When we first talked to him and told him what, what we knew, or that we, you know, sat in the car, um, Detective Stellar asked us if we knew a TJ. And we said no, he just said he bought it off of a friend. And then our first visit with Brian is when he told us that TJ is the one he bought the vehicle off of. That's what he told you. That's what he told <clears throat> That he bought the vehicle off of TJ. But you know that's and not he don't true know, he don't know where TJ is. He dropped him off on 161. Yeah. Did he say how he knew TJ? A friend. Just a friend? A friend from work. That was it? That was it. Nothing more, nothing less? Nothing less. more, nothing less. Okay. He couldn't even give a description of what TJ looked like other than he was a black male. He didn't talk about tattoos? Nope. Going to school with TJ? Nope. Anything like that? He didn't tell me nothing about going to school with TJ. I'm going to check on my kids. I'm going to make sure my kids are right. I go out there. I'm... I'm while I'm out there, I go buy all kinds of stuff on my level. I love them. I bought them Valentine's Day stuff. Well, my, my, uh, my baby mom, I bought her some Valentine's Day stuff. With what? Huh? With what? Me? Yeah. I have money. I have money. You had your own money? Yes. Okay. Good. This statement is corroborated by Brittany Ru and Jennifer Nickel when they told the story of Brian buying Valentine's Day presents for his children. 
Yet the question remains, if he had his own money, what was the point of the robbery? Despite the inconsistencies, the detective lets him go on anyway, since he essentially has his confession now and knows this story is false. All he needs to do now is show the evidence that Brian acted alone. But that's when, I, when I left, I tried to burn the car, and it wouldn't burn, so. Okay. You got what you wanted out of me, no matter what, I'm still going to prison. Doesn't make a difference. So his name's TJ. I told you. Is he bald? He got the tattoo right here. Of what? Two teardrops. Are they solid, or? What do you mean solid? Color the building. He had filled in black? Both of them black. Both of, them, both of them are filled in and they're a little offset. Okay. And he has a cross in the middle of his forehead. Middle forehead. How big is this tattoo on his forehead? It's a, it's a cross. It's like, I can't really, probably like, probably like that big. It don't go too much above his eyebrows. I'm going to prison, though. Really? I'm going to go to prison. Right. But I feel like I can do I know you did. Please, please make sure my kid is alright. Yes. Because I had to drive out there, and my baby mom wanted to know whose car I was driving. I had to tell her it was mine. So baby mom saw you in the car? Yes. I told I told my baby mom that it was my car. She asked me how I got out here. <clears throat> I told her it was my car. I can't say, hey, it, uh, do pretty much help me hostage in. Right, right, and right. If I didn't do this, that he was going to come and kill me. I don't want to put no words on her chest because she's already, she wanted to get back with me, man. Brian changes the conversation away from TJ back to himself. He may have wanted to feel out if he could get any information from the detective about whether his confession was going to affect his potential prison time. He may have also wanted to give himself a chance to take a mental break after creating and describing such an elaborate story. Mom, let's finish some paperwork done. Take it up, please. We'll take five. I gotta go talk to my boss, man, and then we'll co I'll come back and see you. Hey, man. I want my kids to be safe. In March of 2018, Brian Goldsby was convicted of the kidnapping, assault, and murder of Reagan Tokes. His defense argued that childhood trauma played a major factor in his behavior, and he apologized for his actions, requesting mercy from the jurors. Regardless, he was found guilty on all counts. He eventually told investigators that Reagan's last words were, I want to live, a request that Brian denied. During his apology to the court, Brian admitted that there was no TJ and that he lied about him to try to wriggle out of the crime that he himself committed. However, when determining whether Brian should receive the death penalty, jurors were split. So they recommended life without parole to the judge. He agreed with the sentence, suggesting that Brian's reprieve from the death penalty was because of his attorney's hard work and diligence. He's currently serving his sentence in the Ohio State Penitentiary.